1842, it's your skipper here, Darius Dell, to present another episode of Protopo Live. I'm with our good friend, Chris City over at Amber's Group. How are you doing today, Chris? Good, good. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me on again. It's always a pleasure to have you, man. You're uh, definitely one of my favorite folks in the ball space and uh, one of my favorite in investors to interact with in general, man. So for those of us uh, who in our platform that it may not be aware of who you are, can you give us a little bit of background on who you are and what you guys do at Amber's Group? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so I started out as a prop trader. I started out two different desks, uh, Chimera Securities and Xanthus Capital. Uh, and then I made my way to a large Canadian investment bank. I spent uh, three and a half years there. Uh, most of my time was as an exotics trader. So I traded exotic derivatives. Uh, and then uh, March of 2020 came. And obviously, we had a humongous fall event. And I started looking at the environment and I said, you know, there's a much more effective way to run uh, a tail risk fund as opposed to what investors are used to seeing, right? So when you traditionally think of tail risk hedging, you think of, yeah, you're just going to bleed, 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 bleed until you get a vent and then maybe you just get back to even, right? Mm -hmm. So really what, I, what we said was, okay, well, what if you were able to do this, but you didn't bleed, right? And what if you were able to be flat during normal market environments or when the market would go up, you know, you're effectively flat on your hedge. But then when something hit the fan, you return 400, 500 percent. Right. And I got together with a couple of my partners who are ex Citadel, ex CTC dudes. Uh, and yeah, we started this uh, this hedge fund uh, and yeah, things have uh, it's, it's crazy to think how fast time has went, you know, because it's kind of been three years since we started the business. And yeah, here we are now. Here you are now, man, and, and you're being uh, quite modest, man. Uh, you are a one of the only tail risk managers I've ever heard of that's actually up year after year. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's only been three years, but I just want to say kudos to you guys and, and actually ask you, like, what are you guys doing differently from other folks in this in this sort of tail risk hedging space? Yeah, man, I really appreciate that. You know, when uh, when we first came into the business, I think a lot of people did not get what we were trying to do, right? So we would go to conferences, we would speak to people and, you know, you would get allocators that would kind of scratch your head and say like, oh, I'm not too sure. And then it's, it's funny, fast forward to, you know, three years later, there are so many allocators that are kind of knocking on our door now and, and kind of saying, oh, wow, yeah, this makes sense. You know, this makes complete sense. And really, you know, what we did wasn't anything that was massively groundbreaking. What we said was, look, instead of taking a traditional approach to this sort of long vol or you know tail risk thing you could use a lot of like short term medium frequency prop strategies to offset the bleed that comes with with being long tails right so if you have this portfolio effectively your long tails on one side of the book so you have a ton of tails that you're buying and you're using a lot of this you know medium frequency type of active trading to offset that carry so what this looks like for the investor is, you know, if you're doing your job effectively, you know, you're making money offsetting that bleed. And if a tail event occurs, you have this big payout that does not compromise, you know, the, the, the mandate of, of, of the, 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 the tail book. So it's pretty much like think of a guy, it's almost like a market maker model, right? Where you sit in front of screens and you're actively trading, actively trading, but you're always long tails. And if an event blows out, you make a ton of money. If not, you're effectively flat. Gotcha. And when you say medium frequency, you mean like, uh, like what's the duration with which you guys trade on? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's I guess our interpretation of it may be different than than other people, but uh, sometimes we're in these trades for, you know, five minutes, two minutes, three oh, minutes. Wow. Uh, but that's on the side that that minimizes the bleed right on the other side. The book is always long tails. So it doesn't matter at any point of the day, any point overnight, no matter what, there's always that sort of tail protection that's going to be there to perform in, in case like, I don't know, the market gaps down 20% overnight or something like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I remember when you were explaining this to me a few years ago, it's like, this feels like a new asset class, but I mean, to your point, I guess it wasn't necessarily groundbreaking relative to what other sophisticated investors were doing in that space, but it was the first time I had, you know, kind of ex been exposed to it because I've, I've had clients who are risk managers, I've had clients who are volatility fund managers, and I've never seen like both parties kind of interact, you know, so it's really interesting that you guys combine that and form a great business out of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, I think more people are gravitating over towards this. Um, you know, there's a couple of other coming from the prop background, you have guys that do deploy this, this sort of model at different desks, but on the hedge fund space, 
we haven't really seen like a, a hedge fund deploy it mainly in like the tail the tail risk area right you'll see relative value vol shops kind of do something similar to this but like we are purely tail risk we're trading like these way out the money uh options on you know the whole us equity complex so that's why the book is mega mega con convex um so it's like you know we have investors that ask us well can you kind of smooth out the returns and you know make more in normal environments and we say yeah sure but the thing is that's not what we're trying to do right we're trying to have this payoff profile where the investor is flat during normal environments and you know if a tail event happens you could potentially make you know 4x 5x this really big return so a ton, of, ton of value in that that just saying just being flat in a normal environment there's a ton of value in that because obviously you know if you think about the starting point of valuation and this is more institutional space right like from a longer term perspective, five, 10 years, you think about the starting point of valuations, particularly in the equity market and in the credit markets, you know, the expected returns are actually gonna be, you know, much lower than they have been in pre and That doesn't mean that actual returns are gonna be lower, but the expected return ex ante is gonna be lower. And so being able to add something to your portfolio that is, you know, flat in good times and, and up a lot in bad times in that environment is gonna be super valuable, I think, for a lot of institutional asset allocators. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you even have to think about the math behind it, right? It's just like really simple. If you have a tail hedge that just constantly bleeds on out, right? And think about the math like this. If you have uh, $10, right? And you lose 50%, right? So you're now down to $5. You need to make 100% to get back to even, yeah. right? And when you have these sort of tail risk funds or tail risk strategies that just constantly bleed, that's what investors generally get is this poor sort of product where, yeah, you may, and I'll walk through the math on this as well. Let's say you allocate $1 million to a tail risk hedge, right? And then after three years, it depletes all the way down to $100,000, right? And then that person makes, you know, a thousand percent on that $100,000, which is amazing. You're just back to flat. 100%. You know what I'm saying? Like, Chris, you just you just perfectly explained my favorite thing to explain to our retail clients at 42 Macro, which is the concept of volatility drag. Yep. You can have the same returns, but different levels of money at the end of the process because of how you, the path your uh, assets take to get to the process. And this is why tail risk funds in general, you know, kind of have this bad rep, you know, in the context of, you know, the bleed that you just identified. So it's awesome that you guys are actually addressing that and creating better outcomes for your clients. Right, right. That's how we look at it is like if you can do something that adds value that's better than that, then, you know, investors should understand the value add in itself naturally. Right. If you have more so of a profile that's like this, right, flat, 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 and then huge return as opposed to, you know, constantly bleed on out. And then every you know five years, you may get an event that brings you back to, to even. And actually, you know, when you think of just like the tail risk hedging space in, in COVID, you had a lot of this because yeah, there were some funds that put up really good numbers, but there were a lot of investors that were really unhappy with the numbers that some of the funds returned because it's like, well, this is one of the biggest fall events in history. Yeah. And uh, I, I didn't really make that much money. You know what I mean? Like it really didn't help my my overall portfolio. So that's why, you know, I think uh, this style of, of tail risk hedging, this unique style of tail risk hedging is pro will probably be more accepted by more individuals as as the, the the space develops it's it's still in its infancy stage you know the tail risk space um as opposed to you think of something like long short equity has been around you know for for decades like tail risk hedging you know is, is relatively new in, in the grand scheme of things so. that's it ltcm kind of kicked that off <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh so shifting gears a little bit one thing you guys also do at amber's group that i find very valuable for myself is you guys put out these amazing white papers and I would argue, and this is, you know, just me not even blowing smoke, but I think you guys have taken the baton from Chris Cole and, and now are the, you guys are now the, the, the key guy to go to for, for these uh, vol white papers. So congrats on a lot of the research that you guys do there. Um, kind of what's kind of big top of mind, big thought project you guys have been working on lately? Yeah, you know, so I, I, I really appreciate that, but that means a lot to us because, uh, you know, we take a lot of time and we put a lot of uh, effort into these papers. And yeah, Chris is actually a friend of mine, you know, so um, he, he's done really good work in the past on, right. on all his research papers, which, which have helped sort of like pave the way for us. Right. So that's that's really cool to, to, to hear that. Um, yeah. You know, so uh, there is something very interesting that's going on right now in the ball space. And, you know, as, as we talk about, I, you and I have spoken about this before, but like 
even though I'm a tail risk manager, I'm not a perma bear, right? Like the value of what we do is being able to trade volatility for our clients, right? So you'll get in the tail risk space, a lot of like doomsday sort of talk uh, that other ball guys would, would would take, right? And and we're more so, the ethos of, of our firm is more so trading based, right? So I hate touching on this with too much aggressiveness because it feels like, oh, here's another tail of tail of risk manager, you know, saying here's a, here's here's a air porn. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, right, exactly. But uh, the, the real interesting thing has been how we have seen short volatility make its way back into the system at such a rapid rate. That has been um, really, really surprising. And I'll walk you through a couple of things. So uh, we have this way of tracking net notional Vega on the street, right? So that's all the volatility that has been traded. And we kind of break down the directionality component of this. Morgan Stanley actually has a, a, a pretty you know decent way in, and they started putting out these charts, um, I'd say like last year. But more, if you guys don't want to reference our work, you could reference Morgan Stanley's work. And what it shows is that the net notional Vega today is higher than it was during January of 2020. And this is really important because when you think of January of 2020, that was a time that was notorious for short volatility. Everybody was short variant swaps. Everybody was short volatility across the board. Um, you know, VIX was single digits for a couple of, of blips there during that January 2020 time. Mm -hmm. So to think that there are more people that are short vol today than Jan 2020, it's a surprising sort of thing. And this is a byproduct of the fact that the options market has grown so much. Um, so there are some people that would say, well, you know, there's more options traded today. So of course, more notional Vega would be traded today. But this is where we kind of go a step further. When you look at the price of tail risk options today, locally, so if you track this from a look like a local vol standpoint, and what I mean by that is for, um, you know, for the listeners is let's say you do some sort of like floating strike analysis where you look at the VIX 10 Delta one month call, mm -hmm. right? Historically, and where has that traded from a, a local vol standpoint? Yeah. The prices that you're seeing today and the prices you're able to get executed at today is cheaper than any other vol environment that I have seen. So some people may say, well, vol VIX isn't, you know, the lowest level that it's been, right? And what I would say to that is that locally, where you are able to get executed on these sort of things in the tails, because remember, the tails are very, you know, sort of illiquid, yeah. um, is just never been a time like that in previous history. And the reason why is because the appetite for tail selling is back, right? So mm -hmm. we have noticed more institutions that are axed to sell tail options, right? And I'll give you guys just a little more context from, from our uh, standpoint. You know, we are plugged in with different brokers where, you know, we voice trade with, with certain people on the street. And for the last, you know, three years, if you call a broker and you say, hey, you know, can you get me to somebody that sells me these tails? They're gonna laugh at you, right? They're gonna be like, Nothing. "People don't sell tails anymore. You're crazy, right?" So, so that's been that's been like the, the the narrative on the street. This year, you are starting to get more of those natural axes where people are more inclined to sell volatility and sell tail options specifically. So to us, that has been one of the the big antenna raisers where we were like, "Oh wow, this is a." This environment is 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 really is really something. It's dangerous. It's it's you know any I mean so this is the natural pattern of financial markets. Like low realized volatility begets low vega, low implied volatility, low implied volatility begets more risk taking, and eventually something blows up. Right? We don't know what the something is going to cause the thing to blow up, but we know generally speaking from studying economic history the types of things that cause stuff to blow up. Right? You know, so it's you know obviously recessions and stuff and all that all that jazz. In terms of like, you know, kind of a couple of questions on what you said earlier, like you, you mentioned like the tail, the, the, um, you know, transacting locally at these tails is just as cheap as it's been in a really long time. Is another way to measure this, you know, I don't know if I'm saying this right, because I, I, this is what I call it, but like I call it put skew, like looking at the spread between like 25 delta puts and 10 delta puts. Are you effectively saying like that's as low as it's been in a really long time? Well, when you look at measures like that, uh, it gives you an understanding to to know that like okay vol is low right skew is low vol is cheap you could do like sort of like a naive sort of 
sort of um, look back on like VVIX, which is like the vol of all. So that yeah. tracks like VIX, right? So there are metrics that you can do that will give you an understanding to know that vol is cheap. Yeah. But finding out how cheap the tails are, or if there's a natural supply of tails, it, the only way you'll be able to figure that out is if you go out and you're executing on that, right? Because, you know, the tails are, are pretty liquid. So you may be seeing, you know, a, a five or let's say a 10 vol by 15 vol, oh, yeah. right? But the actual execution, you know, may be closer to, you know, a, a 11 ball or something like that. So what we're trying to say is that, you know, the level of VIX is is low for sure. I mean, today we're getting a little bit of a ball pop, but before that, you know, the level of VIX is low, the level of these other metrics is low, but we have not seen a time where locally in the tails, you are able to execute at these prices uh, that, that you're getting. So that's really you know the, the 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 more shocking thing for us but yeah you know there's different there's many different ways where you could measure vol you could say oh, i'm going to take the at the money you know divided by you know the 25 delta put or something like that or you know the, the 10 delta put or vice versa you, you know divide the other side um or you could just look at that 10 delta put historically you know what that what that is priced so there's many many different ways that you could kind of go about with that gotcha gotcha and then follow-up question is sort of what do you think is driving this sort of like oversupply of tails of, of, in general, like, you know, cause clearly we track positioning pretty closely uh, here at 42 macro. And like, from what we can observe in our positioning analysis is that the, the street, like the invest, the buy side is still very heavily net short this market. Uh, when you aggregate non-commercial net length uh, of futures options market divided by open interest across all equity instruments, it's only in the 17 percentile in the historical time series going back to 1998. And so it's, it's, you know, very clearly like this net short bias is there something on the other side of that that's like sort of offsetting that or like where is this sort of like who is selling all this tail all, all this tail ahead yeah yeah so there's a there's there's a lot of well, different what? nodes. It could be an entity <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of different nodes to this sort of question so just you know bear with me as i kind of walk through this please one of the most popular trades in 2022 was the long dispersion trade yeah. right so you know inherently when you are uh, long dispersion, you are short correlation. And because you have such bad market breadth, a lot more sort of vol shops and macro shops have been taking this sort of like long dispersion trade uh, in equities. And it's worked tremendously. What this means, if you're inherently long dispersion, it means you're selling index vols, right? So if you're going to be long the, the names inside of the basket, you're going to sell the index vols. Naturally, that suppresses index vols and that suppresses s p vol and vix volatility so the popularization of the uh this sort of crowded dispersion trade has definitely oversupplied you know vol to an extent that's not the main main driver you know i think naturally the main driver is due to some of these sort of systematic programs that have made their way back and the reason why they made their way back is something that you touched on earlier, Darius, which is, you know, the behavioral cycle as to what goes on. Yeah. And I think that this is really important for investors to understand. When you think of 2017, 2017 was a was a time period that was notorious for short, vol for short volatility, right? It was a time period where you had S&P one month realized vol, you know, printing around four, just insane numbers, you know, the market was just not moving. So short volatility worked for 2017, and it worked very well. Right. That's what caused Volmageddon in early of 2018. Right. Mm -hmm. So everybody that was short vol got wiped out in, you know, Volmageddon early 2018. Then it switched. Then people said, oh, long vol, right? Long vol is the thing. Long vol is, is where it's at. If you remember December of 2018, what ended up happening was, you know, the Fed was talking about, you know, interest rates and, uh, you know, Fed was talking about raising rates and the market dropped 20 percent a month and vol really didn't do anything and people said 35 yeah yeah people said oh my goodness long volatility sucks so what happened from that point from that point more short vol programs started to make its way back in and for a year and some change we fast forward now and now we run into COVID, right march of 2020 where all the short vol guys get completely blown out and now everybody's like Long vol is the best thing since sliced bread, right? We love long vol. We want long vol. Now we fast forward, we go into 2022, right? What a cycle. <laughs> right, exactly, right, exactly. 
what what ends up happening is long fall doesn't perform and people are like long fall sucks long fall is terrible and short volatility now you know continues to perform and that's where we are in the cycle right so this sort of behavioral cycle that has transpired it's amazing how fast it is transpiring it's like people are very short-minded and they're coming in and they're engaged in these sort of systematic programs and you know you have zero dte stuff that, that are being traded more large institutions are, are using or deploying these sort of option overlay programs where they're just coming out and selling fall so from a behavioral standpoint i think that's the most important thing to to think about is that more participants are interested in this because it has been working it's one of the and here's why in my opinion this is my own just you know anecdotal view I think the reason it always comes back at this cycle that will probably persist until the end of time is because when you back test these strategies, they have like some of the highest sharp ratios ever. So yeah. like, even if it like doesn't work in this one period of time, all you need is like six months or nine months to pass before people start going, man, this is one of the best possible strategies I can allocate capital to, right? Yeah. From an ex-ante return perspective. And so it makes a lot of sense why it always comes back. And Generally, it's like, you know, one, two years later before you basically get the opposite. You kind of need time to pass for an institutional capital allocators to really get comfortable with the strategy again, because they're naturally inclined to be comfortable with it because it's better than most other things they're looking at. Yeah, yeah that, that's my take on it. Totally, yeah. totally. I mean, you are you're spot on with that. You know, there's a don't quote me on the exact numbers on this, but it was like if you look at the historical um, or if you look at like the Kager and then also like the sharp on like selling a one month variant swap on the S&P 500 yeah. prior to March of 2020, it had insane numbers. So I think like sharp of like 2.25 or something like that. Right. And then you come into March of 2020 and literally for the, for the last like decade worth of gains were given back in a three week time frame. Right. So like you know, shorting variant swap worked tremendously well for, you know, like a decade and, and a half. And then you gave that back and lost some more, you know, in, in a matter of three weeks. I had a couple of buddies go out of business. <laughs> they were they were all variant swap sellers, unfortunately, in March of 2020. Yeah. You know, so that that's really that's really the catch. Right. It's like, um, you know, vol ten short vol tends to work. And like I said at the beginning of this, we are traders, right? Where the ethos of this this firm is is from a trading base, not you know a, a philosophical sort of base. So we understand that. Look, there are times where opportunistically shorting ball makes money. Absolutely, you know you should be doing it. But I think what ends up happening is exactly what you said that some people will back test this and then you know they'll they'll run a quote unquote systematic approach to doing this sort of thing and you know they'll they'll sort of get caught up in in this and. Uh, you know, when when things start to shift outside of the normal range of the distribution, they can't really accept that or make that sort of pivot. And then it kind of leads to this blow up risk. You know, I, I can't tell you how many how many larger institutions were pitching shortfall in like 2017 or like 2018, 2019 or or sorry, 2017, 2019 were, were the two main years where these institutions, I mean, you look at like bank notes and like some of the things that some of the banks were pitching their clients was like, yeah, short vol. If you don't short vol, you're crazy. You know, like you're, you're crazy for not shorting volatility. So. Yeah, hundred percent. I've been saying to clients that this remarker so much reminds me of 2019. Like you have so much, like the positioning was offsides with respect to investor positioning. There was a fundamental view that the economy was headed for a recession that really, in my opinion, didn't materialize until COVID. You know, who's to say we would have gone a recession or not? We did have a minor yield curve inversion and whatnot. There's, you know, the jury's still out on that, right? And so a lot of what we've experienced in 2023 is just like the unwind of this sort of misguided, ill-timed recession view. Now, we still have the view that we're still going to have a recession. It's just, you know, we believe that that recession was always going to be a late 2023, early 2024 event relative to an investor consensus that came into the year, expecting it to be the first half, recovery second half, right? And so it wouldn't shock me that, you know, based on that consensus and the positioning that had to, you know, one get put in place, but also has to get unwound and has been unwound um, to some degree, you know, maybe it's like first half rip, second half crash, you know, like who knows that if that's a, the outcome, we don't think that's gonna be the outcome, but um, it certainly could be the case just given this, this seasonal pattern we're talking about. Yeah, totally. You know, I think, uh... I see a lot of people putting out research on what they think the market is going to do next. And 
the one thing that I would say is that I'm looking at some of the takes and I like it's hard to to so again what we do is from a trading standpoint right so we don't really have macro takes so we don't really try to you know have directional takes or anything like that but it's hard to disagree with either side on some of this right and I think that that speaks as to how special this environment is is because can you see the market going to all-time highs in the next three months maybe can yeah. can you see the market pulling back right and and you know kind of testing the 2022 lows in the next six months maybe you know like yeah. it's, it, it's, <laughs> that's it's a wide dispersion yeah <laughs> yeah you know like i think that the range of things that could potentially occur in this environment when you look at everything that's transpiring from everything going on in you know rates fx um you know from an actual uh macro standpoint with, with some of the policy changes that could potentially be occurring with with you know some of the macro numbers that, that are occur that are occurring and how those things affect the economy i look at this as like i'm like wow i'm happy to be a vault trader because you know macro guys have to deal with a lot you guys gotta kind of juggle a million things right now in this environment which so with so many things that are like you know swinging and pivoting yeah, I mean, you get our research, right? Like you see, like every month, like we, our macro scouting reports a hundred slides. Like, I wish for the day where it's like sixty slides. You know, like like <laughs> in like a bottom of the recession, like it's just blue skies ahead, Fed's cutting, doing QE. Like that deck's gonna be fifty or sixty slides. But really, for the last year and a half, it's like, man, I, there's a, the range of the distribution of probable macroeconomic outcomes is very flat. Has been flat for for a considerable period of time. Maybe with with the exception on on growth because we've been slowing really from a growth perspective, really primarily since um, first half of 2021. So that that call has been easy, but the, getting the recession timing call right, getting the ebbs and flows of recession uh, inflation right, um, and really understanding the Fed's reaction function to it, because it's kind of evolved a little bit uh, a couple times throughout this process, that's all been very difficult. And, and you've had to have, you know, kind of do a lot of longer term time series analysis to understand like what the probabilities of that distribution are. And who's to say if we're even correct, but I do think we're doing a better than bad job of, of helping investors stay with that. You know, I'll, I'll follow up and um, cause you know, you, you kind of, uh, Colin, if you can throw this, um, these slides on the page, I, I just want to kind of get your take on this, Chris. And so we mentioned this. And so here, here's my, like, you know, we, we try not to do crystal ball, like predict every wiggle in the stock market analysis. That's not our, that's not our role. It's not our business here at 42 macro. Our, our business is, you know, helping investors kind of manage macro cycle risk broadly. You know, if the market's about to crash, we want to make sure you're positioned defensively. If the market's about to rip, we want to make sure you're positioned offensively. What the market's going to do over the next two to three weeks, like we have tools for that, but that's not our primary responsibility. And so, you know, if you think about like, you know, putting my crystal ball hat on here, I could easily see the whatever we're experiencing right now, this correction we're experiencing right now, to be the sort of like bear trap that creates the blow off top that creates the crash, right? And so, and, and this is how we can kind of get to that, you know, so we, this is our, our aggregated positioning metrics. We track all these statistics on, on a daily basis and our layoff morning note, uh, all the stuff we get from the CFTC commitment is a um, commitment of a traders report. This is aggregated non-commercial net length as a percent of total open interest across all the markets that feed into those particular asset classes. As I mentioned, we're in the 17th percentile for us equities, very low um, cash is very high. So it's, it's a, it's at a level we're raising cash at a level that's historically consistent with like longer term market tops. You're, if you look at AI bulls, bears, or AI bulls minus bears, or AI bulls, you look at the skew index, you look at the level of realized volatility, we are sort of at levels that are historically consistent with market tops. So I could easily see this being like a, a pullback that kind of leads you into like, okay, everyone put the bear trade back on, that ultimately gets unwound into a blow off top that allows for the market to really crash the same way that we saw kind of in March of 2020. Um, and the reason I say that is because we know that kind of like the final three months leading up to a, a market peak ahead of a recession, because we still believe a recession is a high probability event materializing sometime between October 1st and March 31st. That's about, about as narrow as we can get that forecast range to. And so it could be October 2nd or March 30, 30th. You know, I actually don't know the, the answer to that, but the, you know, it's, we think it's, it'll materialize sometime in that window, which suggests the market's likely to peak sometime in that window as well. Historically, that's been the case. Market tends to peak very coincident with the, you know, kind of the peak in the employment cycle. And what we find is that in the year leading up to mark recessions, S&P's very strong performance, 16% median return with an interquartile range of plus 14 to plus 20%. But what we also know is that in the last three months, you get more than half of that year leading up return. And so if you, know, if you think recessions probably sometime in the beginning of next year, or maybe even 
the latter part of Q1 of next year in terms of when we start the recessionary process, that's saying that the market could easily peak in December or January. And if this market peaks in December or January, people are going to short the, the lows of the summer lows that we're going to experience here and get absolutely royally squeezed into the highs. And that, in my opinion, is likely to create the um, create the actual, you know, kind of what we call phase two credit cycle downturn. That's going to get you guys paid in embers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that's uh that's a very, very valid point. And, you know, like I said, I find it very hard to disagree with with takes like that. I, I think that that's very, very feasible. I see aggressive you know, bears sort of making their, their case around here why the market should pull back. And what's the best narrative you heard on that side? Um, you know, I, I think the best narrative that I have heard or the more viable narrative, I guess I would say, is that just from a purely, uh, you know, supply and demand perspective of, of, you know, the market has rallied X amount in X amount of time and you'll probably get some people that are taking some stuff off the table. That's probably something that I can, you know, resonate with a little bit. But uh, on the other side, you know, we talk to RIAs and other people that are on the street. And dude, there's just a lot of RIAs that have missed this first rally that want or need to put their clients into equities, you know, 100%. because they are scared that they're going to miss the next leg up if it comes. And I think that the AI narrative that has really taken place has given everybody the carrot that that's, you know, sort of in front of them to say like, all right, this could be the accelerator of, you know, the country's GDP over the next three, four years. And uh, we can't afford to miss this. We can't be the idiots that, you know, kept our clients in cash, you know, the entirety of the time. So we have to buy so that's kind of the side that like i also see is that like i could totally see just all dips being bought because these advisors are just plowing cash back into work and especially coming in towards the the end of the year you know as as time passes you have more of a bullish case as to why equity should go up because what ends up happening is you know you you're now in october or let's just say September, October, you got one more quarter now as an RIA who kept their clients in cash, you know, for the majority of the year and the s and is up 20%. Yeah. You're going to have to get them, you know, you're, you're running the risk of losing your clients if, you know, you don't get them in, you know, these, these, these some of these names or some of these exposures. So I think that that's the hard thing to, uh, to, to battle with, with when I look at this sort of stuff is that like, yeah, this market could totally get bought up going into you know the second half of this year because you just have structural flows that are just forced to kind of make their way back in 100 percent, man that's 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 our view i mean exactly like if we didn't have the positioning dynamics that we observe that we're observing in our metrics uh, right now i would say yeah like what's the point of trying to play for the last i don't know call it five percent up move in the market like what's the if you see five percent upside and 20 20 to 25 percent downside that's a terrible risk reward trade but i have a lot of conviction in that five percent Whereas I don't have a ton of conviction on when the minus 25% point, point starts, right? I have, yeah. you know, a sort of six month interval when I think that's likely to, you know, commence. But, you know, between now and then, we still see a decent amount of right tail risk it's precisely based on what you said. It's not fundamental. Well, it's partially fundamental. You know, actually, if we can go back to the charts um, where we show, uh, so this is our most recent around the horn. Yeah. So this is our weekly uh, presentation where we show our weather model is actually, you know, the market has now casted, or not the market, the economy has now casted itself into what we call Goldilocks. And Goldilocks, um, for those who are not familiar with our systems, you know, Goldilocks is a, a condition where the the, uh, the economy is accelerating in growth terms and inflation is decelerating in growth terms. And historically, that's been by far, like by a country mile, the most bullish um, 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 outcome for asset markets. And so clearly a lot of that, you know, we've seen this has been going on since April. So clearly a lot of what we've seen really since that May breakout in S&P terms has been a function of this. Now the question is how long, how much longer can it persist? There's a couple things that I think might actually contribute to it being, you know, fairly persistent at least over the next quarter or two. And the reason I say that is that, you know, we continue to see all the resilient consumer data. I think, you know, quite frankly, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a victory lap on this. I authored the call that the U.S. economy was going to be resilient a year ago. I didn't hear anybody saying it. I didn't even hear anybody saying it as early as as late as like jank Q1 of this year. But now it's kind of obviously become very much consensus. But what's not become very consensus is what's likely to create the next leg of resiliency, if, if only on a transitory basis. 
And when we go back and we look at this kind of the GDP statistics over the last few quarters, it's very clear from our perspective that if we don't go into a recession soon, i.e. like Q3 or Q4, i.e. let's say the recession starts in Q1 or even beyond that, that time interval, U.S. corporations are grossly undervested and, and, and under inventory for a soft landing scenario. Like if you look at the last five quarters, GD, uh, investment has shaved off uh, 29 basis points of GDP on average. You know, so, you know, well over 100 uh, basis points on a cumulative basis. And you're talking about uh, uh, inventories of shaving over off, you know, 75 ish basis points on average per quarter. Right. Like so there's a if a consumer continues to spend. And by the way, nominal goods are real um, real PC on goods is 5.4 percent through month annualized in the most recent month of data. Like we're going to have to have an inventory and investment cycle, however, transitory, however shallow. And that's something to me that I think it kind of create an additional leg of resiliency in the second half of the year that could get this sort of RA investor community kind of really on board with, hey, the economy is soft landing. Now, we don't think the soft landing is the highest probability outcome, but we do believe that the probability, the, the narrative around the soft landing can rise in probabilistic terms from the perspective of market consensus. And that to yeah. me, they can get a blow up time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely I definitely see and agree with that as well. Um, and, and that's what makes markets right is narratives. Narratives will create positioning and totally. positioning is what, you know, kind of moves prices, you know, when you have people moving aggressively or, or, or less aggressively. So, yeah, I, I can totally see that. And I think the other thing is that people are reaching for reasons to look to buy equities here. You know, like people want a reason or they want that narrative because of all the sideline cash in 2022 um, and earlier this year. So I could totally see that sort of event taking place. And, and the hard thing is that when you have market participants normalized to such negative news, what ends up happening is like you get there and then they realize, well, this isn't that bad. Right. And this is kind of what our case was for inflation uh, a year ago was that. You know, our view was that you wouldn't see a vol shock due to inflation because it was just so well telegraphed, mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of market participants were ready for inflation. So when it happened, you know, they, there wasn't a massive deleveraging of equities and a rush to buy vol. And I think that as you progress now into this sort of, you know, macro environment, people are kind of looking around and, and you know, it's playing into what you're saying, Darius. So, but they're, they're looking around, they're saying, well, this isn't that bad. And, you know, maybe the Fed can pull off the soft landing. Yeah. And that's really the narrative that is needed to get people to kind of come back in and, you know, push the market up for that next leg. And I pity the the, the investor that buys the, the high fate chasing that. Because again, <laughs> I think it's better to buy it sooner rather than later, right? I and mean, that's kind of the nature of the beast, right? Like I like in the next like three or four months to like Q4 of 2019. And to all, you know, from like October of 2019 through like January, February of 2020, right? Like, I think it's going to be like transitory soft landing, right? Because we did, if you go back and we study our grid process back then, you know, we were in like what we call inflation, that's growth trending lower. Uh, sorry, we went from inflation, growth trending lower, inflation trending higher to deflation, growth trending lower, inflation trending lower. But in the fourth quarter of 20, um, 2019 and into the first couple of months of 2020, we saw that we transitioned to reflation growth and inflation trending higher at the same time. And that obviously from a back testing standpoint, you know, is a much more risk on type of environment. And so I could easily see like a few months like this Goldilocks, this transitory, you know, sort of this, uh, this now casting a uh, success of Goldilocks that I've just highlighted. What if that continues? Give me like four or five more months of that. Everyone sucked into the soft landing trade. People have sold as much vol as they possibly can. The capacity of these strategies is maxed out and everyone's on one side of the boat again, just like they were in January, 2018. When at the time we said everyone's on one side of the boat, it's very similar. I think it's it, to me, it's a lot of similarities. Really, nothing's ever the same in financial markets. But you know, the longer you do this, the longer you kind of you know are diligent about studying these processes and and and, and business cycles and, and market cycles, the more you can start to see some things line up. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I think behaviorally, from you know what we could speak to in the vault complexes, we believe that that's where we are in the cycle. That you know the next sort of a uh, bigger vol event that occur will be much more reflexive. And, you know, we, if you follow me on Twitter, uh, you know, I talk a lot about the spot vol beta, right? You'll see like, you know, recently I've been talking about this uh, a lot because the spot vol beta has been, been changing. We actually wrote a paper 
uh, in uh, on our on our website that talks about the changing spot ball beta in the VIX complex. And really, what this means is, for every one percent move in the S and P, what does this translate into vol points, right? So, you know, for for listeners, they could think about this like this, where you know, like let's say the S and P drops one percent, you may get VIX going to you know. 20 so 15 to 20 five ball point move and there may be times where the s p drops one percent and vix may go from 15 to 16 only a mm -hmm. one ball point move right so that sort of reactiveness it, it's not stagnant it changes right and what our thesis is is that you're in an environment where you're going to see much more suppressed vol and much more elevated vol during those moments of market stress so mm -hmm. a lot of people saw 2022 Right. And they said, yeah, vol, long vault sucks. It doesn't work anymore. You know, like VIX is broken. You'll never see it go above anymore because of zero DT options and whatnot like that. And they're just, I couldn't tell you how much, you know, they're extremely wrong <laughs> on that, on yeah. that view. And really this year is affirmation to our thesis because you saw vault get crushed down at a level that you haven't seen at that rate you haven't seen, right? So it's like spot ball beta just went down in a straight line. It's mm -hmm. because so many people came in to sell vault. So many people aggressively came in to sell vault. And we think you're gonna see the same thing on the way up. When, you know, fall starts to explode and on the way up, that strength is gonna be much, much more stronger than people anticipate. Um, so when we look at the environment and we look at how many more participants are trading, you know, U.S. options? How many more participants are trading U.S. options towards selling vol? And the reactiveness of what can come from that during the next event, whether it's, you know, three months, three years, you know, from now, whenever the next sort of real vol event is, our belief is that you're going to see that sort of real, real vol move uh, and that blow off because structurally this vol market is really, really changing and. Uh, it can lead to that more sort of bigger vol events than people kind of anticipate. That makes a ton of sense, man. That's awesome, brother. We'll wrap it up there, man. You've been super generous with your time. You're one of my favorite people to connect with and talk to. Like I always geek out on this stuff and I learn a lot whenever we connect. So man, thanks for your time. Uh, where can we send folks to come find you? Yeah, you guys could uh, find us at ambersgroup.com or you know follow me on Twitter at K-S-I-D-I-I-I. -I -I. And uh, Derek, share the feelings are our mutual brother. I don't have to tell you. You know, it's uh, you, it's always a pleasure chopping up this stuff with you. Absolutely, man. It's an, also another blessing to uh, be with another Christian brother as well, man. It's um, you know trying to carry the flag out here for us both. It's great absolutely. to see you. Man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we'll wrap it up there, everyone. We'll catch you back here next month with our friend Nick Alaris. Cheers. <laughs>